Welcome to Back to the Bible Radio, featuring best-selling author and internationally known Bible teacher Warren Wearsby. Someone has said that truth is stranger than fiction, but fiction is more popular. I suppose that is a factual statement. Truth is not always popular, especially when that truth gets down to where we live personally. But our God is the God of truth, and Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, and five times in your Bible you will find the Word of God called the Word of Truth. Now, there is such a thing as truth. People deny this. They say, well, all truth is just relative. I wonder if that includes that statement itself, all truth is relative. For if all truth is relative and that statement is true, then it too is relative and you can't believe it. No, there is such a thing as truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. And that's why the Bible is called the word of truth. What a blessing it is to realize that your Bible is the word of truth. We are not searching for truth. We who are Christians have found truth in Jesus Christ and in the Word of God. What blessings do we enjoy as God's children? Because we have the Word of truth and we believe it and we practice it. Number one, because of the Word of truth, we are alive. Alive in Jesus Christ. James chapter 1 verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We are begotten into the family of God by the word of truth. You know, when you and I were born the first time, we were born dead, born sinners, dead in trespasses and sins. We had no spiritual life at all. We may have been religious, self-righteous, but we just didn't have any spiritual life. Anything spiritual did not interest us. We were not concerned about the Bible or prayer or worship. If we went to church at all, it was out of a sense of duty or perhaps to try to earn some merit and go to heaven. And then we heard the word of truth, and that word of truth gives to us life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, the word of truth points to the way, and the word of truth imparts the life, because the word of truth is what gives us our spiritual life. You know, it takes two parents in order to be born. We're born of the word of God, and we're born of the spirit of God. Jesus said in John 3, 3, you must be born again, except a man be born of the spirit. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Peter tells us in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, that means man's seed that dies, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of truth is what gives us our spiritual life. And so because of the word of truth, we are alive. People say, well, what can the word of truth do for me? It'll show you the truth about yourself, but perhaps you don't want to face the truth about yourself. We are alive because of the word of truth. Secondly, we are assured because of the word of truth. Now I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 1. If you want to turn there in your own Bible, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, or a better translation is, when ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, the guarantee, the down payment of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Now, what is he saying in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14? That we are assured through the word of truth. Now, once again, he tells us how a person is saved. First, you hear the word of truth. You discover that this word of truth is good news. It's the gospel. 
First, there's the bad news that you're a sinner, and then there's the good news that Christ died for sinners. Then you believe, and when you believe, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I do not believe that Paul is saying here that the sealing of the Holy Spirit is a post-conversion experience. The tense here indicates that when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, this is the only way to be saved. You hear the word of God. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The very word of truth that you hear can generate faith in your heart. You hear the word, you believe, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I notice that Paul writes the gospel of your salvation, not just the gospel about salvation, not just the gospel of a salvation. There's a personal pronoun there, the gospel of your salvation. Uh, Jesus Christ is concerned about you personally. Paul wrote to the Philippians, work out your own salvation. Doesn't mean work for your salvation. It means live out your Christian life because you are a unique and very special individual. Your salvation. Perhaps you have not yet claimed your salvation. Perhaps you are still on that broad road that leads to destruction. The Word of God says that when you trust Him and you believe in Him, then you are saved. You receive the Holy Spirit of God within. You have the Holy Spirit to seal you. All of the work of salvation has been completed on the cross but we have not yet entered into our complete redemption in going to glory. How do we know we're going to get there? We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. The same Holy Spirit who wrote the promise into the Word now registers that promise in our hearts, and we know that we are going to heaven. Thirdly, because of the Word of truth, we are approved. Now, we don't just simply want to be saved and then someday go to heaven. We want to get busy and serve God. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, before I read the key verse we're going to be looking at, I want you to scan those first, oh, 10 or 15 verses of 2 Timothy 2 and notice with me the pictures of the believer. You know, in the Bible, we Christians are pictured in many different ways. For example, in verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What is a Christian? A child in God's family. Verse 2, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We are stewards. God has given us the treasure of his word. We should commit it to others. In verses 3 and 4, we are soldiers endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In verse 5, we are athletes striving for the crown. In verse 6, we are farmers laboring in the field to get a harvest. And now when you get to verse 15, you discover that we are workmen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that word study means be diligent. Be diligent to do what? To show yourself approved unto God. Approved as what? A workman. Now, there are only two kinds of workmen, according to this verse, those who are ashamed and those who are approved. We are supposed to be working for God. And how do we know whether or not our work is adequate? How do we know whether or not our work is approved? It is tested by the word of truth. That little phrase, rightly dividing, does not mean dividing your Bible into different areas or different divisions. Uh, the Greek word rightly divide simply means to plow a straight furrow. It has the idea of, of cutting a straight line. Here's an engineer building a road, and he's supposed to go straight through with that road. Here's a man who's cutting a stone for a building. He has to cut that stone straight according to the blueprints. Now, what he's simply saying is this. When you handle the Word of God in your work, when you're following the Word of God, cut a straight line. Be straight with the Word of God. Don't go off on detours. In verse 14, you find some of these detours 
uh, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Oh, how many people like to argue about the Bible. And it doesn't bring any profit at all. Verse 16, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, Paul is saying, don't go off on detours in the Word of God. You just cut straight through the Word of God. You measure what you're doing by the Word of God because that Word of God is what will test your work whether or not you'll be approved. I notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says in verse 1, we then as workers together with him, verse 4, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. How? Verse 7, by the word of truth. How do you know that your work is going to be approved of God? Are you following the word of truth? Are you testing your ministry by the word of truth? That's all that God requires. Just follow the word of truth. Cut a straight line. Don't go off on detours. Well, because of the word of truth, we are alive, James 1.18, and we are assured, Ephesians 1.13 and 14, we are approved, 2 Timothy 2.15 and 2 Corinthians 6.7. And there is a fifth reference now. Because of the word of truth, we are able to answer. That's a good word, isn't it? Listen to Psalm 119, verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation, according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. You know, when you know the word of truth, then you are able to answer your enemies. When you read Psalm 119, you find out that the writer was facing many enemies. They were reproaching him. They were lying about him. They were trapping him. They were opposing him. And yet he always had an answer. Why? He knew the word of truth. Oh, let's be experts in the word of truth. Because of the word of truth, we are alive and we are assured and we are approved and we are able to answer those who would accuse us. In other words, we will end up workmen who are approved by God. The word faith is a key word in our Christian vocabulary. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we cannot understand God's word or receive God's eternal life. This is why the Bible is called the word of faith in Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Apart from the word of God, there can be no real faith in God because faith is based on the word of God. Well, what is faith? Well, faith is confidence in God that is based on his word, confidence that leads to obedience. Faith means obeying God's will in spite of feelings, circumstances, or consequences. Now, this is why we need the word of faith. You see, you and I are so prone to give in to our feelings. We're so prone to, to yield to our circumstances or to fear the consequences of what we do. Oh, we want to trust God and we want to obey him, but uh, is it really going to work out? And so we have fightings within and fears without, and the Christian who really wants to succeed has to walk by faith. And he's not going to be able to walk by faith apart from the word of faith. The Christian who wants to succeed must give himself or herself fully to the word of faith. As you read Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, you discover what the word of faith does to the life of the believer, what the effects are that come to the life of the believer who trusts and obeys the word of faith. What does the word of faith do for you? Well, number one, it bends your knees. You say, well, Brother Wiersbe, what are you talking about? Let me read verses 1 through 4 from Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. 
For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You see, man does not want to live by faith in God's word. Now, everybody lives by faith in something. Faith in your muscles or faith in your money, faith in your job, faith in your loved ones. Everybody lives by faith in something. I hear unsaved people say, well, I don't really believe in this faith business. And by saying I don't really believe, they're admitting that there is a certain amount of faith. Anyone who takes a prescription to a pharmacist is living by faith. You're trusting him. Anyone who signs his name to a check is living by faith. You're trusting that there's money there in the bank. But man resists living by faith because faith hurts man's pride. Man wants to be self-sufficient. He doesn't want to depend upon God. It's like Naaman back in the Old Testament. Naaman was a leper. And the prophet said, you go down to the Jordan River and you just uh, dip yourself in the water seven times and you'll be healed. And Naaman got angry. He said, we have more beautiful rivers back in my hometown. We have cleaner water back there. Why should I dip myself in that dirty Jordan River? Well, he didn't want to live by faith. He wanted to exalt himself and be self-sufficient. Man resists living by faith, and that's why man resists the Bible. The Bible is the word of faith, and the word of faith bends your knees. These Jewish people Paul's writing about would not bend their knees. They would not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. Seven times in this uh, passage, Romans 10, verses 1 through 6, you find him using the word righteousness. What is man's great need? Righteousness. How does he get this righteousness? By faith in God. Oh, but he doesn't want to do that. He will not put his faith in Jesus Christ and receive the righteousness of God. He wants to have his own righteousness. Many people are like these zealous Jews. They are religious they are sincere, but they are not receiving righteousness. You see, faith glorifies God. Self-righteousness glorifies man, and man resists living by faith. Why, Paul himself is an illustration of this. Philippians chapter 3, Paul tells us what a righteous Pharisee he was and how he had to give up all of his goodness and all of his religion to receive the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Philippians 3. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, refuse, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Now get this, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's what Paul's writing about. They would not submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. Righteousness comes through faith. Well, we must submit ourselves to God's word. Have you bowed your knees to the word of faith? Have you said what the word says about sin is true? What it says about hell is true. What it says about me is true. What it says about Jesus and salvation, this is true. What does the word of faith do for you? The first thing it does is it bends your knees. You've got to submit to God. Now, the second effect that it has, it not only bends our knees, but it speaks to your heart. Verses 5 through 8. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man who doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh, notice that, speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what saith it? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. 
Now, this word of faith speaks to your heart. Why? Because your heart has to believe. And where does faith come from? It comes from the word of God. Look at verse 17 of Romans chapter 10. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now you connect verse 17 with verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. The word of faith speaks to our hearts. And by speaking to our hearts, it can generate the faith that we need. You see, man by himself cannot generate faith. God has to work in our hearts, and it's the word of faith that does it. What did Jesus say in John chapter 5, verse 24? He that heareth my word, there's the word, and believeth on him that sent me, there's faith, that's the word of faith, hath everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus spoke to a paralytic in John chapter 5, and he said to take up your bed and walk. And there was power there, and that word gave faith. Jesus said to a man who had a withered hand, stretch out your hand. And that word gave faith, and he stretched out his hand. Now, the point that Paul is making is this. The word of God is not far away. You don't have to climb up into heaven to get it. No, God sent it down from heaven. You don't have to descend into the deep to get it. No, the word of God is near you. In fact, in the case of these Jewish people, the very word of God was in their mouths. They would go to the synagogue and confess the word of God. Now, says Paul, the word of faith bends your knees. You better submit. And the word of faith speaks to your heart. You'd better hear it because with hearing comes believing. That's the beautiful thing about it. There is no excuse. There is absolutely no excuse the Word of God is near to you, and you can reach out by faith and receive that Word of God. What a wonderful promise from the Word of Faith. Are you helping to get that promise out to others? Have you believed that promise yourself? We're glad you joined us today. If you missed part of the program or you'd like to listen again, just come to backtothebible.org. Be sure to come back again for more wisdom from God's Word. Back to the Bible, leading you forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ.